I took my cell phone because I wrote something here one day. I said, I'm going to read this before we start our message. And uh, I'd like to do that today. person next to you and until I say something here, go encourage them with some encouraging words. Okay, tell them how beautiful they are and how glad you are that you're here today and all those sorts of things. Don't stop until I say something here. You'll be my pillow. Praise God. Guys, guys. You stop, not yet. Not yet. Okay. All right, I know you've just been seated, but I'd like you to stand with me again. How's that? Is it okay? Okay, because you'll be seated for about two hours after, so. But if you can stand, those of you who have our ambassador charge, you can stay seated. But I want you to say this with me. Follow what I say, okay? In preparation for this message. Hallelujah. I love God. I love Jesus. Turn to the person next to you and I love you. I love my brothers and sisters in our church. I love my brothers and sisters in other churches. I love those who are not a part of the church. In essential teachings, we have unity in non-essentials, we have liberty in all things, we have charity, we have love. Dear God, I'm prepared to listen to your word, change my mind, change my heart, and make me more like Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. That's something I plan to recite. I don't know if we're going to maintain it to be that way, to so memorize it, but that's something I'm planning to just um, recite every Sunday before I give the message so that our hearts will be made with a position, with the right perspective and attitude. So um, today we'll be continuing the message that we have, Living as Servants of God. This is part two. B. Okay, part 2B. And it's about worship. We talked about the first one. This is a review. We talked about attitudes in serving the Lord. That was the first part. Attitudes in serving the Lord. And we're not going to review that anymore. We're just going to go review a little bit about what we talked about last uh, Sunday, which is in relation to worship. First one is attitudes. The second one is in relation to worship. And last Sunday, we um, looked at the first sub point under this and that is our worship our worship ought to be only for God our worship ought to be only for God Exodus 20 verses 1 to 6 says and God speak all these words saying I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage thou shalt have no other gods before me Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And then we, we looked at Luke 4, 8, where it says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And we tackled two things. The first one we talked about in worshiping only God. We talked about how some entities will vie for, try to steal your worship, or we will be inclined to worship these entities. We talked about Satan. We ought to not give that worship to Satan. Not Satan. I want you to say this with me as a review. Not Satan. Not Satan. 
Not Satan. We learn that Satan will try to, even from the very beginning, even before the fall, he tried to steal worship, or at least he tried to be worshipped the way God was, and that's the reason why, one of the reasons why he fell. The second one is that he will continue, and he's continuing to do that. He will trick us, deceive us, suddenly come into, like crouching at the door of our hearts. That's the reason why Peter said that. Be careful, be watchful, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, looking for someone whom he may devour or destroy. A prey. He wants to make a prey out of you. You've got to be very watchful okay, of his tactics. Now, the second one we talked about was we got to not worship graven images. If this is something that a lot of people try to do, dodge a little bit on the pulpit for fear of offending certain particular religious group who are very much involved in worshiping graven image. And I did clarify last Sunday how I love um, these groups of people. My heart goes up for them because I was once, a, once one of them. Well, in fact, I still am because I remember I never took my membership away. We didn't even have membership, I think. Okay, but I, I don't remember uh, rescinding any kind of membership, but I still am a part of, and let me just say, on the pulpit again, I'm still a part of the Holy Catholic Church, the Holy Universal Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to call me Roman Catholic, just say I'm a Biblical Roman Catholic. If you want to say it that way, that's a better deal. Right? Now, uh, how, uh, how you're able to live with that, um, only the Lord and you would be able to like settle that between yourselves. But when you talk about grieving images, we pointed out that, yes, it could. It could speak of different things today. And we pointed out how many of us have idols. And we also pointed out that even Christianity have created idols among ourselves. It's the reason why there's a big division in the body of Christ. Because we've elevated somebody to a position of authority almost seem akin to, almost close to the authority of the Word of God Himself. Because we love Him so much, we love her so much, we became a follower of these people. And we made idols out of preachers, out of churches, out of denominations. When in reality, instead of the body of Christ being united with a common core, we have destroyed each other. To the detriment of what? An ineffective church. Detriment of the church that it become it became I'm sorry it became ineffective. Now continuing that, not Satan. Say it again. Not Satan. Not Satan. Second, not graven images. Not and now the third one, not creation. Say it with me. Not creation. not creation. Now if you look at these things, they actually overlap. Satan is a creation of God. Graven images are creations of people, but they overlap. Except that the Bible somehow specified each one of these, and I didn't. Take all of them. I'm just giving you some of them. But they are very important for us to learn and really look into the scriptures so that we could see how we could be spared from these things so that we may really worship none other but the one true God alone. Okay, now the first thing I'd like to read to you is Romans 125. And I want you to be read Deuteronomy 17, 2 to 5. If you have your King James Bible is with you. We'll be reading it all together. But first let me read Romans 125 which says, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Worship the creature instead of, or more than, not even instead of, but more than the creator who is blessed forever. Deuteronomy 17, 2 to 5. If you're there, I'll be reading it to you. Okay, Deuteronomy 17, 2 to 5. You may follow if there be found among you, within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God, in transgressing his covenant, what kind of transgression and wickedness? Verse 3, And hath gone and served other gods, and worshipped them, either the sun or moon or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded. Behold, it be true, in the thing certain that such abomination is what in Israel, then shalt thou bring forth that man and, or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman, and shalt stone them with stones till they die. 
Now, we're not going to explain this deep or deeper about what those stonings were all about, but it tells you and me that God sees this worship of creation as a very abominable, it's, it's a very abominable practice to Him. He takes it very, very seriously. If you want to just look at it that way. Okay? Now, Acts 14, 11 to 15, if you would please turn there. Acts 11, Acts 14, I'm sorry, 11 to 15. Acts 14, 11 to 15. This is what it says. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lake Urania, that gods are come down to us in the likeness of man. And they called Barnabas, Jupiter, and Paul, Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people. Which, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. Okay, now look at Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9. Revelation 22, 8 to 9. This is what it says in verse 8. And I, John, and I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard, when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and thy brethren, the prophets of them, which keep the sayings of, his, of this book. Worship God. Say it again. Worship God. God. Now these scriptures that we saw, okay, we read, talk to us about people who are involved in worshiping sun, the moon, the stars, the heavenly bodies, and they attempted to worship the apostles, and they also attempted to worship angels. And God is basically telling in those scriptures, no, the apostles even refused to receive worship. We may call them saints nowadays. They refused to receive worship, and the angels refused to receive worship as well. And these are some things that we saw here. The sun, the moon, the stars, the heavenly bodies, no matter how majestic they are, they ought to not be worshipped. The apostles, no matter how much of inspiration they are to us, or the people right now who are serving God very faithfully, no matter how, how much or how great of an example they are to us, there is somebody else who is way much greater than they are. And God is saying you should not worship them. You may take them as an example. You may follow them as they follow Christ. But it doesn't mean we got to worship these great faithful workers of God. And angels, no matter how lovely they may look. You know what? Angels have been portrayed in so many beautiful and different ways. From very little tiny beings, chubby little red cheek. Kiddos, right? With beautiful little cute wings to this very tall, big, good looking, blonde, blue eyed, shining, 12 foot or feet creatures with wide wings. Like, they've been portrayed so many ways and so awesome. But God said, it doesn't matter how awesome they may look, they too are just created things. We ought to not worship them. Are you here? Amen. Through history, this is something that is sad to say. We have seen people, groups, and tribes all over the world. Aztecs is one of them. And many more, not just them. Who have sacrificed at the altar of the sun, the moon, the stars, and heavenly bodies, even volcanoes and the oceans, the thunders, and all of these things have killed thousands and thousands of people and beheaded them. See, you've seen a movie like this where heads would roll down those stairs and thousands of them were beheaded. And I said, you just saw one movie, but this is a reality in many tribes. Where families lost their family members, mothers lost their son, husbands lost their wives, wives lost their husbands because people were trying to appease something who they thought was God when in reality they were not gods at all. And this is something that we know 
happen in reality and history. And even now we were eating, my wife and I was eating the other day. I forgot which restaurant it was. I think it was a Vietnamese restaurant. We were having pho. Um, that's what they might consider as healthy food, okay? We were having pho. And suddenly, I don't know where I was just like looking down. I was like about to devour my plate. And then suddenly I heard a strum, a guitar strum. Strumming sounds so loudly. And then before I even got to look at the person, she started, these are young teenage girls. I would believe they were young teenage girls. Okay, but these, she, one of them started like talking really loudly and confidently, with a smile on her face, beaming with something, a cause that she was wanting to like share to the people. And the, the, the companion she had started like distributing cards to the people, the customers. Okay? They were trying to raise funds for an orphanage. And my mind and my heart started like pumping like louder. And, and I was excited and I had mixed feelings and I'll tell you why. But seeing that postcard raising funds for a certain orphanage would have cost me great joy. And I was, I was thinking to myself, what boldness. What boldness. They were like Christian. You see it's a Christian group. Okay, I said, what boldness of these girls, in, in, and then you, you would see the customers there. Many of them were really awkward about these things happening. But instead of being happy, my heart was gripped as well, because the moment I look at the card, I already knew that my presumption was correct. They belong to a group that is so huge in a country that believes that their founder is the unique son or a unique son of God. They belong to a cult. But these girls were sacrificing their morning, and I don't know, their afternoons. And this is something I saw, boy, two boys, I was like about to sleep in my car, and I saw a boy coming like close to me. I thought he was gonna ask for something. And I saw his pamphlets, and, and, and his, he's, got, he's got a bag. He, was, he has this messenger bag, and I know it was full of tracks and all those things, but I knew right away they were fundraising for the same group. One of the members before, <coughs> belong to that group and she said I don't understand FCF he said so why not I <laughs> and she goes I could not even convert I could not even convince the ladies to bring flowers every Sunday and she goes I don't understand FCF I said why not I because I, not even, I could not even convince the couples to bring lunch every Sunday <clears throat> you know where I came from? There you go, right? Every Friday, she said, I would be selling fish in the market for the whole day. And whatever I earned that day, we brought to the church. And that was not only her, many of them. And she couldn't understand. She said, if this is really the if this is a true Christian group, how come we're doing so little compared to the cults where I came from? I said, I don't know, speak to the ladies. <laughs> well, I know the history of that, but the point I'm making is this. People, even young teens, are spending and expanding themselves and spending the prime of their lives for a cost that we know is a deception from the enemy, and they're so gladly doing it. And this is something that is all over. People say things, in worship of a creation that they don't even know. When I was growing up, there's a song that I actually researched on. I said, I want to see what the real words of that, so I could see the context. If I'm just misjudging the writers, I said, I want to see the context of the song. I said, okay, I'll just write all the song. I, I look at the entire song and I translated it in English. It became a very famous song in the country where I came from. And this is how it translates in English. I'm not going to say it anymore in Tagalog. You probably know the, the, the song if I, if I say it to you. It starts out with this, I worship you. It's not a Christian song, though. It's not a gospel song. You already know that this problem. That you already know some the problem. Some problem is coming, right? I worship you. Here's a translation. More than your presumption that I just love you, my respect for you is greater than this life I own. Sounds good, man. He was really in love. There is no equal. I'll even give my life. He says, I worship you. Whatever reason isn't important. Verse two. The point is, I worship you. Love is what I feel. How can I paint you? Colors aren't enough to create a portrait of you. 
I worship you. He says, I worship you. And you see, I, I, I was trying to like see if it's something biblical there or we could like tweak it in such a way that it will mean something good. And then this is the killer, okay? Is I worship you. If it's sin against God to worship you, perhaps he will understand someone like me who extremely loves you. Can he blame me, my love? I worship you. Whatever reason is not important, the point is I worship you. Love is what I feel, the point is I worship you. Whatever reason isn't important, the point is I worship you. La la la, la la la, oh ho oh, oh. ho. The point is I worship you. La la la, la la la, oh ho oh, oh. For the love of me, I can't imagine people who claim to be Christians who follow anyone. And I'll say this, okay? And I'm not, I'm not gonna endorse any candidate here, but I think I have to say this. For the life of me, so I will not be voided of tax exempt status here in FCF, I'm not endorsing anyone. But this is my heart. For the life of me, I cannot imagine how anyone could claim to be a born again Christian and vote for somebody or a candidate who's totally opposed to Christ. Amen. And there are so many in the body of Christ who claim to be and does what I said should not be done. And they do that even blatantly and even arrogantly. And they're very, very proud about those things that they do. Something that I'd like to really encourage everybody, we've seen millions of people living in deception they follow a person, they follow an ideology, as if there are scales or glaze over their eyes. They, they, and, and as they march, as they march like happily and gleefully towards their own slaughter. And they don't even know that they're doing it, they proudly do that. Now, can I say to anyone, anybody who says he or she is a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, and yet support someone who stands opposed Christ. Please check yourself and double check yourself. Because the spirit that you're following or that may be working in you may not be the spirit of Jesus Christ. It may be the spirit of the Anite Christ. And we blindly follow. We blindly follow. We blindly follow a creation. According to this, this is, something, this is something that is so true that if we're not careful, we'll be wasting our devotion, our sacrifices, our time, our energy, all of these things, our services. We're talking about being a servant. If we're not careful, we'll be wasting all of those things that we spend and invest for supposedly a kingdom of God. We may be very dedicated in our devotion. We may be very active in our church. We may be very active for a cause. But if they are directed to the wrong entity, we are being deceived and we are worshiping a creation rather than a creator. And it is a deceptive, it, it is a deceived worship. It is an erroneous worship. Worse is not only that we're doing something wrong, but in the eyes of God, as we read a while ago, they are abominable to God. Instead of us incurring the blessings of God, we're incurring His wrath. It doesn't matter how much we say God bless America. If we're opposing God, we will not incur His blessings. What I want to say today is if ever America is still being blessed, it's no longer because of what we do. But because we're still harvesting some of the things that our forefathers invested in this country. They were still receiving the trickles of it. To ascribe worship to created things and beings, that which only is true with the divine is to attribute worth to them that is not real. Anytime we worship anything or anyone that is not God, we are trying to tell that thing, we're elevating that thing or that someone higher than the position that they ought to have. It is a deception, it is denial of truth. Now, there is awesomeness in the sun, but God is greater than the sun. 
I was like looking at the verses a while ago. I said, man, that's scary. What was that song that you were talking about? God, thou, thou son, what does it say? I'm not criticizing it. I just want to know the context. So I still want to study that again. I was just like singing that. I said, whoa, whoa, again, what was that? I said, thou son. Okay, any of the celebration even memorize it? All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with a sing, oh, praise him. Hallelujah. Oh, okay, see, I got the context, man. It was scary. <laughs> because, because, like, after that, the next queen says, Thou burning sun with golden beam. It's like almost speaking to them, right? Thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise him. Oh, praise him. So they're not praising the sun and the moon. It's saying moon or sun. It doesn't matter how golden your beam is. You've got to praise him. You moon, it doesn't matter how silvery your sheen is, you gotta praise him, right? Yeah. Man, it was my heart. I mean, when I was a very young kid, I dreamt of actually being on the moon, traveling, like stealing my way into Apollo 11 or something. And like, really wanted to be up there because I really love the moon. And look at it, it's like, oh man, imagine under that glimmery place. I, I thought when you get there, it's like shining and all of those things. And I wanted to be there. But it doesn't matter, they say, it doesn't matter how majestic they look. Our God is more majestic than any of the heavenly bodies or any of all these heavenly bodies combined. <laughs> Nothing is more glorious, more powerful, more beautiful, more magnificent than our Father. Yay. Okay? And by the way, it doesn't matter how great your pastor is. I'm talking to those of you who are not attending this church. <laughs> it doesn't matter how great your pastor is. It doesn't matter how scholarly he may be. Or it doesn't matter how theological wreck and, and, and man is like prudent and intelligent this guy is. It doesn't matter how great they are in your sight and how faithful they are to God. They are still created things. And they could still err. But we've got one God who is greater than all these pastors and all servants of God combined, who will never lie to you, who will never be deceived, who will never deceive you, who will never be tempted to take money in the ministry, and who will always be faithful. That's our God. No angel in heaven could equal Him. When I was a very young Christian, a pastor was preaching, Inside, in one of our fellowship, I forgot if it was a church or a fellowship, and he said, what's the opposite of white? And everybody like answered, what? Black! What's the opposite of like, of, of um, what do you call this? Of, uh, of sour! Sweet! Sweet. Yeah, they have all these things, right? What's the opposite of, of, of a woman? Man, what's the opposite of, of, of uh, riches? Okay, he said, what's the opposite of, of God? And everybody answered what? Yes. Satan. And he said, no, you're wrong. He said, because Satan is just an angel. God has no opposite. Has no opposite. He's got no equal. And there's something. Yes, there is greatness in people, but we've got a God who's way much greater than anybody or anything or anyone. Anything you could imagine. God is greater. And we, right here at FCF, you and I, we decide to worship no other but the one true living God. He is not a creation. We decide to worship not any creation. We decide we will worship only the one who deserves this worship. Not the creation, but the creator of all things. No one compares. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Okay? So the next one, okay, this is not, not the creation. And then the next one may hurt you a little bit. Not money. Not money. Everybody say it. Not money. Okay, this is something that is very common. We already know this. People are preachers, preachers in the church. You've heard it already before. But at the same time, while we are doing that, I think God wants us to be kept right, to be kept reminded repeatedly because of the fact that over and over, time after time, consistently sometimes, consistently sometimes. <laughs> Is that oxymoron? Okay. Contradiction. Because there's only sometimes okay, we still get tempted with money, right? So let me read to you some scriptures that are worth reading regarding that. Matthew 6, 24, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. 
He cannot serve God and mammon. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. One very good example, instead of me trying to relate to you, I'll just read to you the verses found in Matthew 19, 16 to 20. And listen to this. Listen to this. Somebody comes along and behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Boom! Jackpot, right? Is jackpot used only for, uh, for betting or gambling? Not necessarily, right? So I use the word jackpot. Boom! Jackpot! Okay? Somebody wants to give his life to Christ. This is a dream of every evangelist, or the dream of every person who would like to share the gospel, right? Somebody comes to you. How can I have eternal life? Hallelujah. I wish everybody's like that, right? This one had a right question, and he goes, and he said unto him, this is how Jesus answered. Jesus could have answered, hey, come here, brother. Let me show you the four spiritual laws. It would have been awesome, right? There would have been an expected response. That would have been my response. But this is how Jesus approached this. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, all these things, wow, he was feeling good. He was feeling good because he was a very religious, righteous, quote-unquote, person. Quote-unquote, righteous person. And he goes, all these things have I kept from my youth up. Did you see that? Man, I got it. I got it, Jesus. I got it. He said, what else? You know, he thought Jesus was just going to continue with, with the litany of things he has done already before. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Man, okay, this guy said, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. I'm going to give all these things to the poor. I don't care about my money. I don't care about my treasure. I'm going to follow you. He became one of the most famous apostles. Apostles. He became one of the most famous apostles there are. What's his name? What's his name? What's the apostle's name? Anybody know? You don't know because it's not a true story. <laughs> if he had done what he ought to have done, you would have remembered his name. But he did not respond that way. Jesus said, Go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, come, follow me. This is verse 22. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He was so close. So close. I remember the song, so close. So close and yet so far. I see some old people are here today. <laughs> So close and yet so far. Wow. He already did everything that needed to be done except for that one problem. His treasures, money, gold, silver. And he lost it. Speaking of songs, I prepared something that uh, later, okay, I'll tell you the signal. But here are some things that some songs I tried to research that shows attitudes of people regarding money. I had about 15 of them, but I, I said, that'll take up all my time, so I just go down to three, right? Or three or four. The first one, it's entitled Bills, 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 by Destiny's Child in 1989. The chorus goes, can you pay my bills? Can you pay my telephone bills? Can you pay my automobiles? Then maybe we can chill. I don't think you do, so you and me are through. You see that? Hey, you can pay it, we're through, all right? Now the next one I have, Mo Money, Mo Problems, by Notorious B.I.G. featuring Mace and Puff Daddy. Chorus, I don't know what they want from me. It's like the more money we come across, the more problems we see. Maria knows that song. Okay, now, 
the next one, the title is, it was from 1959, but man, it's still being played nowadays by Barry Strong. The title is Money. Subtitle, That's What I Want. Right? It starts at a little, here she come now, say money, money. Damn, 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 right? And there it goes. But it's a, I don't know, it's a different one. It's, yeah, it is. That's the chorus, right? But it starts it with this. Or the chorus, the best things in life are free. But you can keep them for the birds and beasts. Now give me money. That's what I want. Right? Give me money. That's what I want. Uh, a lot of these things, some of them are real, some of them are right, some of them are really wrong in the way you look at the attitude of money. But I like the song, The Four Theologians, I really admire. And I want you to listen to this. Can you please play that? Because this one digs it. This one hits it. But the message is so true, right? Can't buy me love. I buy your diamond ring, my friend. If that makes you feel all right. I give you anything, my friend, if that makes you feel all right. But I don't care too much for money because money can't buy me love. Money can't buy anything. Everything. Okay? It can buy things, but not everything. So that's something I'd like to just like encourage you with so many people even in biblical times have lost opportunity to enjoy the blessings of the kingdom of God because they were tempted to follow after somebody else or something else which you can never ever do serving God and mammon at the same time it is an impossibility in the Old Testament somebody was so I was listening to this on the way here I was like Rabbi Zacharias was preaching and I was going wow that really relates to my message. He was talking about this, this, this servant of Elisha. Elisha is one of those prophets, if not, if not the prophet who created, except for Moses, probably the most miracles, about 16 miracles in the Bible. Double what his master. He used to be a servant of Elijah, the one that we all know, Elijah. And we name our kids Elijah. Nobody can, I don't know, many of us, us would name our kids Elisha. We want Elijah, right? More powerful name. But Elisha had 16 miracles compared to Elijah, but he was a servant of Elijah before the Lord took Elijah, his master. He was asking Elisha, what do you want? And he said, I want a double portion of your anointing. And he got it. 16 miracles, double what Elijah had. And now he is a servant. Boy, I said, man, if this guy acts properly, he could have 32 miracles written in the Bible if he just gets what his master did. Master Elisha, I want what you did to Elijah. I want double portion of your anointing. He could have gotten 32 miracles. I mean, I would just suppose, right? But here goes an event. A Syrian general comes along. Elisha, his master, somehow was used by God to tell him what to do. And that, Sir, and that, that Syrian general was healed. A story in itself, a sermon in itself, that Syrian general was healed and that he was trying to offer some treasures to Elisha, who was used by God. He said, no, I don't want any of those. I don't want a part of that. The Syrian general left and the servant of Elisha ran after him, made up stories. And basically he said, there's this God thing. It's a God thing you're going to do. Give, give me the treasures. He was so close. And yet so far, just because he was tripped, he was trapped into looking at another object instead of looking at God. Ah, oh. there are many people, brother. I think one of the messengers we have. I'm not gonna name his name, but you know it. So, buddy, we had a, like, talked about a cheap measure, right? This life. And he mentioned something about, is he here? I'll mention his name, he's not here, Paul. Okay. He mentioned something about how he and many people he knows, he was trying to justify it. He was looking, he was, he was trying to say, I want to be rich, I want to make this money, I want to make this amount before I actually go out there and serve God. So that, that when I have this, I could freely serve the Lord with no thoughts about this provision because it's coming. And in reality, he said, you watch the attitudes of people's hearts. They name the name of God just to feel justified about their desire for riches. And he said, that was me. And I was cheating myself into believing that I'm doing a godly thing when all of that was really my desire. Gehazi had that kind of complex. 
people that are so close. Let's not go far. In the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know the story. This man walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, slept with Jesus, stayed with him more than a lot of other disciples did. Saw him heal people, saw him raise the dead, and for the price of 30 pieces of silver, lost his soul to damnation. That's Judas for you. There are those people who have intention to serve God, but there is a greater pull in their lives. People that could have been so powerful, you people, I know, people you know, people you probably are still praying for, who could have been used and could still be used by God so powerfully. But they would not even take the step, like this young rich ruler, take the step of really surrendering his life to God and bowing his knees before God because of the fact that his knees are bowed to another God. And these are people who could not just get in there because they're preoccupied with money. Their hearts are there. I want to serve God, but there's a greater God in their lives. And there are some of them who actually made its way, made entry, like Judas, like Gehazi. They were already there. They were close. They were with the prophet. They were with the servants. The people who are already in the church, and then suddenly they're very active. They're doing things for God. They're very, they're out there. And in the moment they found a job, in the moment they found a better job, suddenly their priorities change, and you barely see them in church. You barely see them in the Bible studies. You barely see them that they have justifications. Both of these people. March forward in what they believe is the right thing to do. With emptiness in the hearts and emptiness in their souls. But, the, but, but with this false smiles in their faces justifying every step they take. Just to be able to say I'm doing fine. And I'm being good. And I'm doing well. And I'm helping people. And I'm helping the church. And I'm helping the kingdom of God. But in reality they are serving money. Saddens me because you know people like this mighty men and women who have fallen in their faces just because great big ministries and I'm not gonna name them, a lot of these people, but they just like press proud every now and then. You see a news somewhere on television or on radio talking about this ministry, the suddenly collapses. Why? Because they were blinded by mammon. It's a very sad commentary about the life of any person here if we fall into this. And I pray with all my heart, praise God for those people. Praise God for those people who still clings on and is and has taken the step of bowing their knees at the altar, not of anything else, not of money, not of riches, not of material things. We're in the 80s. This is a song. In the 80s, there was a song that basically categorized the 80s. What is that? I'm a material girl. girl. And I am living in a material world. And I'm a material girl. Many people that bow to materialism and treasures and greed. A story about... This is a funny story. In front of you, it was funny. The guy was like... His BMW, you stop on the freeway. And uh, no offense to Beamer, but his Beamer stopped on the freeway. He got out, tried to, he was going to try to look for something that was wrong. And suddenly, that door was hit by an oncoming car. Boom! The police came. He said, My Beamer, he was crying, My Beamer, my Beamer, the door, I'm going to take so much time to fix it. You know, it's a lot of money. And then the police said, I am really so You guys, you yuppies, you are so materialistic. You didn't even realize your arm's gone. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that came out of my mouth, of his mouth was like, where's my Rolex? <laughs> 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 
getting worse and worse. <laughs> That's what it is. And how people are making God a good name. People that walk with the Lord, messengers of God, who want to get rich, and loses them. One of the most emphatic things that the Lord just gave to me, basically, when we went on vacation, I came back with one of the messages that the Lord just brought to my heart that I wanted to impart to everybody, is to make sure that you let the church know that they strengthen their inner man and their spirit and invest their treasures in heaven. Because honestly speaking, all the money and all the resources and all the efforts that we put in it to accumulate more and more toys and more and more stuff in this world can snap up a finger and a snap up a moment. Boom! You can lose everything. And all those investments we had are all going to be lost. We spent our lives for those things and in a snap of a finger. Either God or Jesus comes, we die, our money loses value. And by the way, all those three are big possibilities anytime. There is no greater investment for your 10 cents than the kingdom of God. Because there's no other prophet will give your 10 cents a value that will last for eternity. Are you here with me? Well, my wife got involved in the business before. What, several years ago? Right? So wait, I'm not gonna mention I'm not I, I'm not never gonna like get involved in a business. Several years ago she got involved in a business. Worked so hard for six months. Sure thousands of dollars. Tax money was surprised. You're a pastor, how do you have this? Right? Until now, years after, I said, Man, this is probably one of the biggest and best investments we ever had. Because years after, we're still receiving checks. But right now it's so low. We're still receiving about sixty-eight dollars. About sixty-eight dollars. Where are you going to get sixty-eight dollars a month for now for nothing? That was a very good investment. But you know what? This investment that my wife had, and me had, we I had, compared to investment in heaven, compared to investment in a kingdom, it's a laughable thing, right? Because kingdom of God is the greatest investment you can ever make with your money and resources. I praise God for people who are not blinded by the glitters of riches and mammon. Amen. Amen. These are the people who keep the church of God marching on. Amen. These are the people who keep the church of God week after week functioning. If these people are not there, a lot of churches would be closed. And by the way, a lot of churches have closed. But praise God, this church is still going on. I came here in 1992. It's 2016. And we're still going stronger. Praise God. Praise God for people who are used by God weekly. Praise God for people who are used by God in events like this. Special locations, special blessings. We have new floors. We've got new restrooms. The restroom's so nice. I want to go there over and over. <laughs> But bless God, who is being used by God? There are people who are just like really giving talent. These people are not rich. But they just realize. They realize that this, this $2,000, this $3,000 they have, the best investment they could make out of it is not even their retirement. That's a good one. But even better than retirement, annuity, all those things, is what? The kingdom of God. They're not blinded by it. They bow before nobody else but God and God alone. And of course, the last thing I'd like to share to you is this. Not self. Everybody say, not self. Not self. Luke 9, 23 says, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Matthew 10, 32 to 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before man, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven, but soever shall deny me before man, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. John 12, 25, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it into or unto life eternal. These three packages of the red have similarities in it. What are they? They give you an encounter and they give you a choice. What is that? The encounter with a Christ and a choice between yourself and Jesus. The question is, who will you choose to be? Because according to these verses, if you cannot worship God and money, you cannot choose yourself 
and Jesus at the same time. Is it over? And let me encourage you. All of these things that we talked about, I think this is the overarching bottom line problem that people have. The devil worship. The worship of creation. The desire for money. All of these things. Desire for material things. All of these things come to the bottom line problem of what? We want to serve ourselves more than God. We all have personal desires. We all have things we love. We all have ambitions. We all have dreams. We all have opinions. We all have doctrines. We all have beliefs that we carry on our own. But there comes a time in your life when you're face to face with the Lord of the universe. And it's offering you a choice. And today is that day. Again. And the choice is, will you serve yourself? Or are you willing to take your crown? Are you willing to go down from your throne? And are you willing to lay it at the feet of Jesus? All the belief systems you have, they're not in accordance with His will. All the desires and the things that you love in this world, even yourself, that do not conform to His heart. And all the choices you have that are opposite the direction that he's leading you to go. Are you willing to let go and die and say, I will live for you? If that is a decision that you want to make today, you're making the best decision in your life. I want to talk more about this, but time doesn't permit me anymore. But it's a good close. Either we continue the direction where we really serve ourselves and at the end of our lives, after our years of 80, 70, 60, 50, or perhaps 30, or perhaps 120, at the end of our lives, we're left with nothing but regret in a most painful way. We're willing to let this life be lived in a manner that we will be living this life as we empty ourselves, allowing God to fill it with His, to live a life that the Bible calls overflowing, superfluous, abundant life. There's no life that is going to be lived more abundantly, more satisfactorily, better and excellently than the life that is traded in the life of God. You don't live your life I'll use mine. Does Adrian want to live this uncontrollable, pathetic, puny little life of mine? Or do I want to trade it with a life that's full of energy, full of meaning, full of purpose, full of order, full of joy, full of love, full of peace, with the assurance that after this short life you are is just going to be multiplied to the grandest scale. The choice is obvious, right? If you want to receive Jesus Christ in your life, and you want to trade this life with His, including all our wretchedness, all our sins, all our nothingness, He is willing and He has already done it. All you got to do now is say, yes, Jesus, I like that. I like it. Everybody by your hands. Close your eyes. If you want to receive Jesus today as your Lord and Savior, your spirit is encountering a spirit. There is a confrontation of a will. But the encouragement I'd like to give to you is this. I'm not going to make it like a lot of people may have done it before and still do. Make it comfortable, make it easy. But let me just challenge you this time. If you'd like to choose God, He has already chosen you. But if you so decide to choose to serve Him and worship Him and Him alone, my challenge for you is to make it real and make it challenging. Not mediocre, not haphazard, 
not in real. That just for the sake of a ceremonial gesture. Make it real. If God truly be your choice, let God truly be God in your life. All in. All in. All for His glory. So if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just pray this prayer from your heart, sincerely, very simply. We're going to admit to God that we have sinned because of that sin we're separated from Him. We're going to open our hearts and invite Him to come into our lives, to save us, to cleanse us, to forgive us, to be our Savior and to be our Lord who will manage our lives as we surrender to Him. If that's the desire of your heart, pray this prayer with me. Those people praying this for the first time, pray this sincerely. Those people who have prayed this before and have received Jesus in their lives as Lord and Savior, support those doing this as well today by praying as loud as you can to make it easier for those who are making this today, this decision. Everybody pray, dear God in heaven. That's what I've heard a while ago. I want to worship no other one but you. I want to give you my mind, my heart, my choices. I want to serve no other but you. I open my heart and I'm inviting you. Please come into my life as my only Savior and my Lord. I admit that I have sinned against you. Now I know I can be forgiven. And although I was separated from you, I know I can be saved. I surrender my life Please take control of it as I desire to follow you from now on. Cleanse me, wash me, forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody just go reach your hands. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I'm praying to God for all these people right now. We don't have time to do an elder call, but we know they're following. You see the heart of everybody. And you see if there is any one of us who may be struggling in some areas of our lives that need, Lord, their appropriation of what you're already doing in their lives. You're there. You're empowering us. The Spirit of God is working in our hearts to do it will of His good pleasure. And just praying, Father God, that you would work in our hearts and in our eyes, that our eyes may be like our Father's eyes. That our eyes may be single. That our eyes may not be divided. Our eyes may be focused, Father, and our faith will be directed to only one, and that is you. I pray, Father, that if there's any temptation still, or anybody, Lord, is really in this, where we are still tempted, dear God, to follow even the works of the devil, or even follow, Father God, those that are, that are not really gods and following people, created things, because they're just so good and so grand. If we have a temptation, Father God, to just work more for money, and sometimes, Lord, we're even hypocritical about it, forgive us that we use the name of a God for such we don't even want to admit evil desires. But Father God, we pray that you'll spare us. Greater God, that we'll be saved from that. And Father, you help us, Lord, more than anything. Help us, dear God, to save ourselves from ourselves. Amen. And that we need you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God.